Up next is Dr. Shigematsu, uh, well known to the group. Uh, Dr. Shigematsu is an assistant professor of neurosurgery, neurology, and radiology in the cerebrovascular group. Completed his training in Japan um, at Osaka and Kobe City Medical Center General Hospital, followed by a fellowship in neurosurgery and neurovascular surgery, a PhD there, and then um, came here to, to complete his neuroendovascular training in the U.S. before joining the faculty in 2019. He's been um, widely prolific in publishing across cerebrovascular topics, but is particularly interested in pediatric cerebrovascular and specifically vein of galen malformation, uh, which he'll be talking to, uh, talking to us about today. So thanks, Tomo, for coming back. Uh, good morning, and thank you, Peter, for the kind interaction introduction. Again, my name is Dr. Tomo Shigematsu. I'm one of the uh, member in the Cerebral Vascular Center and neurosurgery trained. The case Dr. Bederson was showing, it's, it's a very fantastic case and it's a lot scary case if he damaged the vertebral artery and if there is a chance that we can't re save the vertebral artery. She, you said that he didn't have the vertebra on the other side. So maybe like a additional balloon test occlusion or the whole thing could have been helped. Maybe that was, that was I was thinking. But yeah, it's a very fantastic case. So I would like to share my screen. I'll share first and then start the... You know, believe. Share the desktop, and then probably start. I hope everyone will be able to see this screen. Looks good. Okay. Looks good, Tom. So yeah, um, yeah. As Peter said, um, my interest and in then is mainly focused on the pediatric neurointervention. Uh, thanks to Dr. Berenstein, my one of the mentors. So uh, I want to talk about the neuro pediatric neuro uh, neurointervention. Um, this is my close disclosure. But so the topics, um, not just the pediatric neurointervention is not just the vein of gallant treatment of the vein of gallant malformation, of course. So like the first half of this talk, I wanted to review our um, cases, like case numbers or variety of diseases uh, in these two years so that uh, I can show you what kind of uh, diagnosis we are, we are handling. And then the second half of the talk, I would like to talk about the vein of gallium malformation. Again, first review and then give you some updates about uh, the, the treatment. So in our program, the Pediatric Cerebral Vascular Disorders Program in our Cerebral Vascular Center, it, uh, I mean the Pediatric Cerebral Vascular Disorder Program, um, in recent two years, we had a um, total of a little less than 200 procedures for less than 19 years old, so max 18 years old uh, pediatric cases, total 115 patients. And if you see what uh, kind of procedure we've been doing is here, it's showing. So like a third of the cases are, uh, surprising to me is the diagnostic angiogram. was the diagnostic angiogram? In the pediatric area, we try to avoid to do interventive uh, invasive procedure to for it in the diagnostic but uh, still uh, angiogram is helping the patients and uh, it is there is a recommendation from the SNIS like came out in these few years but it is said in here as well but this actually it, if it is done in our hand or Ex, uh, an expert, uh, this procedure is, even though it's very invasive, it, it is considered as invasive, but it, it actually it is a very safe procedure and give a lot of information. 
And technically, I'm talking to the fellows always, but the, technically the angiogram is very, very easy. So the point is, it's not how to do the angiogram, but how perfectly you can do the angiogram. You, you, have, you have to keep that in mind. You have that, if, if that you have that in mind, the angiogram is really, really safe. And it's, and yeah, we've been doing like the thirds of the cases. And then the embolization comes the next. We have some stroke interventions, of course, and we started doing the IA chemo. And then the like a 15, 20% is good with was the scleral therapy for the low flow vascular malformations. And what kind of diagnosis we have? So this is a, a review of the diagnosis we have. Like um, from the neurosurgical standpoint, uh, with our expertise in the pediatric area, uh, which are um, able to help in by means of um, pre-op embolization or pre-op evaluation as well. So we were able to help with uh, pre-op embolization for meningioma or that was an interesting case, the spinal tumor, the aneurysmal bone cyst. And for the ENT, we are able to help with the pre-op embolization with for JNA, and that can allow to uh, for the ENT to reduce the risk for the bleeding for this uh, kind of mass of vessels to take for them to take out. Yeah, so um, and I think this area is growing as well. We should be able to get more cases, and I and the. Within the other cases, um, I would like to comment later in about the new thing we started about the treatment of uh, retinoblastoma and also about the strokes. We should be able to help more with our expertise, including like with some uh, development of our new devices and and associated to the vein of gallium malformation. There's an interesting um, disease diagnosis of the pile AV fistula and also the dural AV fistula in the pediatric area is kind of a little bit special. So I wanted to comment on these. So I want to start. And then the second half is going to be an abgallic malformation. It's like, like half of the cases in our services. As you see, this will be an abgallic malformation. So Let's start talking about the stroke and start with the case. So this is a thrombectomy for the pediatric case. It's already 17 years old. So the size of the body is like adult size. So it was relatively straightforward case from the uh, stroke intervention list. And the patient had 17, was a 17 years old male, had a recent acute heart failure and the patient also had a our right and left ventricle thrown by, and that throw clot into the uh, kidney and uh, have a splenic and renal infarcts. And after and he needed to uh, go to the OR by the cardiac surgery, of course, to place the LVAD and then LV, LV thrombus removal but he was found to have a right hemiplegia and aphasia afterwards. He didn't wake up well. They got the scan and he got, was found to have a thrombus in the left MCA and left, left ACA. This is a before the procedure, you see the clot in the middle of the MCA. And if you see from the side, you see a clot in the um, distal ACA. We can do the thrombectomy with, we were able to do the thrombectomy with a Fairly normal technique. The actually for this size of, thankfully the kid was in the size of the adult, so uh, we were able to use the biggest size of the catheter actually all the way up to the M1 to as aspirate the thrombus, uh, thrombus, and for the smaller clot in the ACA, we were we this time the stent retriever was used to take the clot out. 
and this is the Raffles procedure. Um, the patient had the clot long time in the or most likely so um, even though we were take, able to take the clot out he still have the uh, right side weakness but he's improving well and go uh, the rehab still on LVAD. So well the technology is developing so thrombectomy is getting feasible for uh, LVO and even in the uh, pediatric population but um, well, for the pediatric generation, the randomized control trial is unlikely to be conducted. So prospective international um, population-based registry are needed to collaborate up to the benefit of EBT. This is well said to, to try to find the evidence, but um, because Kids has lower incidence of AIS, substantially delayed in diagnosis. Like those, these points are the points compared to the adults uh, preventing to develop an uh, um, evidence so easily. So we there is a or, recently uh, organized organization, the International Pediatric Survey Organization. We are uh, trying to help to. Uh, make an improvement in this area with them. And just, and talking about the presentation of the uh, pediatric so it's a little bit different from the adults, but what is it very uh, helpful to know is children may have uh, starting rather than an abrupt symptom onset and also commonly report headaches that's very interesting to me as well, and and often uh, prevent with seizures. So these are the mindset that we want to keep in, and not just with the thrombectomy. The patient's etiology of the stroke in the pediatric population is a lot different from the adults. So um, not with the thrombectomy, but just diagnostic procedure, which is as a um, in our hand to safe procedure, as I said, uh, will be helpful for the diagnosis of the etiology. So uh, diagnostic angiogram should help. And the thrombectomy, in my opinion, the cardiac patient will be uh, a good candidate. So we, can, we wanted to still work with the cardiac uh, team to, to uh, to let them know that our procedure will be able to be helpful. And with a diagnostic angiogram, like Moya Moya disease is very, very um, big topic in the in pediatric strokes in the cerebrovascular field. I will not go get into the deep, but, and also from the genetic standpoint, um, this is a very interesting topic. So if I have the time and, and some um, other opportunity, then um, I wanted to go over uh, this time. And recently we started also uh, is to, to help the ophthalmology with our IA chemo. So we are, there is a um, disease, pediatric the retinoblastoma. Um, is the again the technique itself is very easy. We're gonna we just uh, navigating the microcatheter all the way to the ophthalmic artery and then injecting the chemo agents. But we wanted to show you a little bit about the retinoblastoma, uh, the basics. The epidemiology is like one per um, fifteen thousand to thirty thousand and most common intraocular malignancy affecting children. This is well known. The RB1 gene is well uh, also, uh, actually it's very uh, famous. And there's a classification. We only, uh, we can target really um, one 
stage of the uh, part of the retinoblastoma. But and for this, particularly for this uh, stage patient, it looks like the IA chemo is going to help a lot and with a good survival and good function and to save the eye. Um, the IA chemo is, again, is a fairly uh, simple procedure. So we advance the microcatheter from the femoral axis all the way to the origin of the ophthalmic artery, and then take the uh, picture of the ophthalmic artery with the angiogram, and then start injecting the IA chemo. Yeah, it's fairly uh, feasible uh, procedure. And the uh, agents we put uh, place, you know, inject in the ophthalmic uh, artery are these uh, agents. Okay, we can present two cases, but um, again, it's it's very uh, effective, I would say. And then we would like to develop, a, we already developed a relationship with the ophthalmology, so we I would like to get more cases and to help these patients. Yeah. So uh, let's. Uh, now I'm gonna come back to the vascular malformations cases, um, dural artery venous fistula and pile venous artery fistula before going into the vein of gallium malformation. But uh, let me show you another case that we had recently with a with a new finding. This is a five year old uh, boy and past medical history of ADHD autism. And he also had a right facial venal lymphatic malformation. So not just a shunt, but he, he also had the uh, low flow vascular malformation. And this time presented with a new right proptosis. And it was found to have a, like a diffuse multiple area, um, large, uh, skull base dural arterial venous fistula, mainly in the right side of his, his skull, uh, head. Um, we started with embolization, and despite multiple endovascular embolization, actually the it's very difficult to treat these kind of patients because the um, the angiogenetic factor is kicks in actually the everywhere we embolize doesn't stay close and then it recruits a lot of new vessels uh, we were having struggle actually um, but these skull base multiple area dural AV fistula is kind of um, it is classified and infantile type dural AV fistula compared to the simple adults type DRAV fistula or the sinus um, dilation, mainly the sinus, mainly the sinus dilation in the dural sinus malformation. We, uh, so infantile type DRAV fistula is um, usually hard to treat and then the prognosis is um, unfortunately not so good, but it is treatable that we know we had a good cookout experience and we started embolizing, but we were having trouble in this patient. So what's new in this patient? We First, we initially conducted the genetic testing and we also helped uh, start working with the, our genetic uh, department as well. So we started testing uh, the known common AVM mutations that like these uh, ACVR I or LK. So this the fact the known genes mutation for that like HHTs, venogallin. There was um one new uh, known gene mutation in EPHB four. I like other HHB genes or NASA one is the uh, Kepler malformation ABM syndrome uh, mutation. Like these things. 
we checked the all things all returned negative we didn't give up there's an there's um another collaboration for with the other uh facilities so uh we collected the blood from the the shunt area and we sent the blood for comprehensive whole genome sequencing um and it they gave us a different answer that the whole genome uh, sequencing testing demonstrated uh pic 3 ca mutation so um i'm not i listed uh, about the pic k3 uh, pic pi3 no pic pi3 no pic 3 ca um sorry this is a mistype uh, pic 3 ca mutation uh, gene but it is common uh, oncogenic uh, mutation, especially in the breast cancer. And then what is good about this is this has a medication to target this gene. So we started this medication after the fifth embolization. And in, in one month, it, it made a dramatic difference to this patient. It's uh, headache improved, proptosis improved, the redness of the face improved, and um, he is he's a, he doesn't have a headache, so he's more calm and interactive and he's very happy. And, and geographically, um, this massive Jurebi fistula got a lot smaller. So there is the medical uh, treatment is now kicking into the vascular malformation area. This is a very uh, interesting topic, so I just wanted to show. And of course, in the vascular treatment for these kind of malformation, we, we had a good experience like by treating very aggressively, causing a lot of vessels. Like this patient initially presented it at 14 years old. I'm um, sorry, it's not month old, it's 14 years old uh, male and uh, had a massive skull base, a uh, gerobinous uh, gerol fistula, and we treat, uh, treat it aggressively with the 10 session of the embolization. You see in the middle uh, x-ray, how much coils and embolic materials we injected, you'll see that. And we were able to achieve, get the good control. So he doesn't have anything recurred in the intracranial lesion, but still have, he's developing a new small shunts extracranially. So we know that he has TP10 um, gen, uh, gene problem, but we are also gonna run the uh, whole general uh, like, uh, sequence to find out to see to to find to see if he has an option for any medical management and it's a little bit different some um, disease the pio av fish shot it's very very similar to the vein of gallium malformation, but the location is different. So I wanted to see, show and please uh, give comment a little bit about it. This is a case we had this year. This is a 12 month old female and diagnosed as a vascular malformation when she was born. But development is normal and she came to us like in 10 months or 12 months. And at the angiogram, she was at 12 months. So this is a picture. It's very impressive, like a huge ball in the in, like compressing the brain, displacing the brain stem. Its treatment is very tricky. We have to uh, close the fistula, close the shunting point. So and it's it's uh, we're staging. We're in the middle of the uh, like we are going to. Uh, do the procedure a little bit more in the future, but this is like a middle. We have to place the coils and the mass 
and it's a little bit tricky. About the pyoid trigonal fissure, it's, it's one or more pile arteries uh, feeding directly into a cortical vein without the uh, intervening nidus, no nidus, like a typical AVM. And the prevalence is, is very, very rare. It's less than vein of Gallen Mark mentioned it, it, it looks like. But it's very interesting. It can happen everywhere in the brain. And vein of Gallen is just at this vein of Gallen area. I feel like it, this pile AB fissure can happen more frequent, but it's less frequent than the vein of Gallen Mark mentioned. Presentation is very similar to the neonate, uh, the vein of Gallen, but neonate for the neonates, it's heart failure. For the infants, uh, uh, increased heart, head circumference, circumference or the neurological deficit. And if the kids get bigger, the headache, seizure, and then your neurologic deficits can cause by the uh, compression from the enlarged vein. The goal of the treatment is to close the fistula as in a, as this in the short segment. So this is a point. It's very difficult to close the vessel in a very short segment. It's very, very challenging. Um, prognosis is considered to be poor with a conservative management. So uh, usually the treatment is recommended. And interestingly, we had three pio AV fistula newborn cases. And again, it's, uh, I, I need to do more work in the research, but uh, it's, these are the three cases. But within these three cases, it's difficult. We had two hemorrhagic complications. One, we were not able to, uh, we were not able to save. And, um, yeah, well, the one baby is doing good. So, the summary: the treatment for the pyoav fish appears to be very complicated. It's um, unexpected to the say, and it may be a little bit riskier, and outcome may be a little bit worse than the vein of gallium formation. So, I want to do a little bit more work and the research in this area. And then I'm going to finish with vein of gallium formation quickly. The vein of Gallen malformation is we call um, VOGM, but maybe if we could say VGAM is the, the correct uh, terminology. And this is a quick review. The vein of Gallen malformation is arterial venous shunting between the choroidal artery, not directly to the vein of Gallen, but the, the precursor vessel of the main uh, medium prosencephalic vein of Malkowski. So it's not direct shunt into the vein of gallon, but it's the shunt drain, uh, on the vessel that was supposed to go away. And as opposed to the AVM, uh, AV shunts of the vein of gallon are located in a subarachnoid space. Um, I asked some residents a few years ago, but if, no, anyone. Matt, can you help me? Yeah, if where does the nidus locate in the normal AVM? It's not a subarachnoid space, but where do, where is the normal AVM located? I guess it's in the sub. It's almost like in the brain, so yeah. So peel? So feel place, yes. So that's a yeah, yeah, physiology. And uh, that's a anatomy of the AVM. It's different from the vein of gallon malformation. And then again, uh yeah. Uh, the well, as I said, I, I said the AVM has nidus, but the vein of gallon is one of the one type of the V fistula. So the vein of gallium malformation doesn't have a nidus. The prevalence is 
now get kind of getting well known that uh, they did a the good um, survey in uh, Germany and prevalence is one out of 58 and 1,100 live births. These are the the scheme that like to sh usually use in the vein of gallium formation. Um, quickly, the classification of the gallium malformation is a choroidal type and a mural type, of course. And this is a 11, just now six to 11 weeks uh, scheme, uh, fetus uh, vascular anatomy. So this network is the uh, medium pers median uh, prosencephalic vein of Markovsky. And that goes away, and this part only remains and become a vein of gallon. So if this if the shunt happens anteriorly, it becomes a choroidal type. And then if it happens very closely to the uh, the posterior end, it becomes like a mu uh, mural type. It's choroidal type is more usually more complicated in vascular anatomy. And then the, if the AVM is there and then it's just running into the vein of gallon. That's why the, the vein of gallon is dilated. It's separate. It's a separate disease. We call it VGAD, vein of gallon aneurysmal dilatation. Presentation of vein of gallon malformation is if you can get diagnosed. It's diagnosed during uh, pregnancy. Is a routine screening of the echo with the echo, and uh, in the neonate, heart failure is a main presentation. In the infant, the failure to thrive is a good terminology that you can uh, keep in mind. It doesn't eat well, no, uh, no good growth, not gaining weight. Of course, it, uh, and then the increasing head circumference is failure meeting milestones or development. Retardation getting worse is also another presentation of hydrocephalus. The important points on the vein of gallon again is the arterial venous fistula on the mid uh, medium vein of persencephalon. It's not a vein of gallon. Uh, direct shunt. There's a type corridor type and mural type. Intruding vein of gallon baby, especially in the neonate, is a very it's a teamwork. We have to involve a lot of specialties, cardiologists, PQ, NICU, uh, neurology, everyone. So you need to be a good conductor to get a good outcome. The this golden standard now currently is the stage arterial transarterial embolization. So in within five, six embolization, we should be able to get the 80% cure and 80% good outcome. So and it's a very treatable, uh, manageable disease, even though it is it was uh, devastating and hard to treat. Right, Re recently it's, it has become a very treatable uh, disease. And it can develop a hydrocephalus, but usually the hydrocephalus is caused be uh, by the increased pressure of the venous side. So not treating directly the hydrocephalus, but embolizing the vein of gallon is the first choice to treat the hydrocephalus, to just keep in mind. We, this, this year, uh, these two years, we had 11 angiograms to, com to confirm total of uh, duration. So we had like 11 cure these two years. This is a happy news uh, in a vein of gallon in our team. But like the like last week, we had like a three vein of gallon baby or kid in the hospital at the same time, and in these three kids, we had three different challenges. So I wanted to finish uh, show those three challenges and then finish it up. One case was three months female who had the treatment in the neonatal period. And then the second one was two years of females who had already six treatment uh, and came for the, sorry, five, five treatment and came for the sixth treatment. And the third one is a, like a treatment number eight. Like these two 
babies are developing very normally, very happy. But there are some challenges, what kind of challenges? So neonatal period treatment is still difficult, risky. Uh, yeah, I wanna talk a little bit about it. And if you see this angiogram for the second patient, you see like a almost like a uh, puff of smoke, moya moya like vessels. So like it's an yeah, angiogram. It's a cheese. Uh, see like applesauce. <clears throat> and another thing is we can make the we can by the treat, repeat transarterial embolization we can shrink the malformation very nicely once it gets small enough it's getting it will get hard to treat but um the question gonna come up if we really need to completely close the malformation or not um so fetal no, in the treatment of the venal gallium morphine in the neonate, we have to know that we have to evaluate the kid with the right um, modality. So the kid needs the echo and MRI even before uh, the kids get a kid is born, or right after, of course, echo and MRI to see the cardiac function, to see the flow reversal of the, in the aortic arch, to uh, estimate how much the shunt volume is, and to, to see the MRI, to see the brain, of course, but to see the malformation itself. Um, again, we're trying our best to uh, make the embolization safe as possible and efficient. So important thing, Again, here is the kid really needs the umbilical access to save the uh, access for the future, to save the femoral artery for the future. Um, umbilical artery, arterial line, and then at the same time, I, I realize that it's very important to, from the access standpoint as well, but it is also important to make sure we treat enough so that the baby will not come back for embolization within a few months. Uh, that could prevent, that could damage the femoral artery. So it's very important to treat uh, enough during the baby period. But we know that we have to treat enough, but we, it's, it's if we do too aggressive, we can cause the other problem. So, that in that means it's maybe a little bit uh, tricky and difficult. So since 2014, we had 31 newborns uh, with Benogallin or Pyola AB fistula, and 22 babies needed the embolization. We were able to get the 20 uh, transumbilical access in 20 cases. It's not 100% possible. That's, we, we also have to keep that in mind. But we had like eight hemorrhagic complications so far. It's still difficult and the, we know that the vessel and the babies are very fragile. Clinical, we were not able to save like four kids and four cases had the moderate to severe neurological defect. It doesn't mean that the, the family is not happy. There, there is a development as we treat, the baby keeps growing It's even though it's a little bit delayed. So they're happy, but um, we they have the outcome uh, bad, technically a bad outcome. So you have to follow that up. But so as you see, the normal development is in within like sixty percent, not eighty percent compared to the other population. Um, this is the case we had a hemorrhagic complication. The the from the endovascular standpoint, it is. We, it's, we know that it's difficult, but at the same time, from the neurosurgical standpoint, probably it's, um, I feel like we can still, there is a place to make an uh, improvement in the management of a hydrocephalus. Um, so that's maybe the one part that we can improve. And if you talk about the angiogenesis of um, some venom gallium malformation keep shrinking 
what well, uh, as we treat, but some you know gather malformation keep growing as we treat. That's a very tricky uh, part. But we now getting more new technology. Like recently, we know that the angiogenesis can um, increase the number of the treatment to cure. And as we have now new technology with a low profile balloon microcatheter, we are um, that helps to close more vessel than the other uh, catheter that we had. So those like combining those uh, new technology, we are getting um, these difficult case uh, nicely managed. And we wanted to do the genomic, um, anal uh, uh, but not to yet analyzed. So this is a place where we want to work on. But as we already reported, like at, um, seven cases of 12 procedure using the uh, low profile balloon microcatheter. As you see, even if we, the baby develops this much angiogenesis, we if we use a balloon microcatheter with a uh, liquid embolic material, we are able to close more than we used to, uh, we used to be able to. And then the, si the last thing, we have a transvenous embolization developed like in recent five years or so. So it's becoming feasible and then safer, but the natural history of the small residual, like if we shrunk this much, probably this one, the left one need the embol uh, transvenous embolization, but if this little bit, it's only left like a little bit like this in the right one, do we really need to treat it? We don't, we really don't have the um, natural history of so those small ones. So that's a good part we wanted to know. It's just still a challenge to make a decision. Uh, so uh, good parts that we can work on and then follow up the patients. We compared the patients that we was cured before 18 years old versus the, the patient we were not able to cure before the 18 years old. The, the, uh, the procedure for the residual uh, vein of gather malformation after 18 years old, we, we've found that it's, it's interesting, it becomes more riskier than dangerous. And the, the patient, uh, we didn't cure the ABM before the 18 years old, the clinical outcome was worse. So it's very interesting. So that helps some, give some idea that we sh most likely will have to uh, cure this vein of gallon malformation before in the childhood. Uh, and, but it doesn't completely answer that the very, very little residual malformation with a normal development or if we have to cure it or not. We will get um, the transvenous uh, technique will become safer. So we should be able to answer in the, in the near future. So again, the challenge is neonates for the bleeds, even though we have can um, treat 80% safely, there's a challenge in the neonates, the hemorrhagic complication and the hydrocephalus. The angiogenesis are getting managed right now, but there's a uh, also genetic uh, factors coming in. And transvenous axis is getting safer, but again, is it really safe to leave a small or is it safe to close the small residual, then how much, how small is the malformation that we can leave? Those part is a little bit uh, gray area. So we want to work on. Okay. And I want to conclude with this slide as of my uh, presentation. These are the reference. And thank you.
Thanks a lot, Toma. Um, you know, it's maybe it maybe it's obvious or maybe not to people who don't do endovascular a lot of time, but every one of those cases you showed is uh like the highest grade of difficulty in, in the field. So nice work. Perfect. Uh, great. CPK. Yeah. Can I can I make a comment? Sadi Gatan here. You know, I, I've had the luxury of being uh, uh an active, uh, I should say, spectator in most of this work and seeing the brilliance of what uh, Alex and Joanna and Tomo have been able to do. And Josh, you know as well as I do that this this was a formidable disease that uh, neurosurgeons tried in vain to treat initially. And now guys like Tomo make it look easy. Uh, and I echo what Chris is saying. These are the toughest of the toughest cases uh, on every level, not just for the endovascular uh, specialists. So kudos to all you who are doing this. With regard to hydrocephalus management, I echo what Tomo said, that you've got to treat the vein of Galen first, and that's not obvious to the majority of the world still. And secondly, endoscopic third ventriculostomy works quite nicely when the angiographers have done their job uh, and hydrocephalus persists. And I, I know Peter is uh, rapidly gaining experience with this too. So Tomo, great presentation. And again, thank you. Joanna, do you have comments? Yeah, so Tomo, that was, that was a great uh, presentation. Um, and uh, show highlighting some of, you know, over the last couple of years are a really um, wonderful mix of cases. I think that uh, we're, we're trying to learn as much as we can about these disease states, but they're so rare. Um, it, Vein of Galen, we're able to, we're, we're able over the last few years to really make some um, good technological advancements in curing patients you know we, with the we've done um transvenous uh and uh published our, our series and we've done the uh you know, we with this new mini mini balloon and that really has helped with the angiogenesis and we've published that um i think with the peel and then uh fistulas, it's so rare that we really need um research collaboration and it's the Ipso is really, um, yeah, they're they're trying. Um, I think uh, you know, trying to achieve some some funding to have a, a nationwide kind of database for this stuff because I think that's um, that's really how we're going to learn. But but um, lastly, I want to say that the the genetic part is really exciting, and that comes really from our uh, collaboration with the facial vascular malformations because that's where that's really being um, pushed medical management. Uh, some of these patients with you know these large uh, facial malformations, th those are those are biopsyable. So it's like a it's like a, we're starting to collaborate with um, hematology, and there's a vascular malformation center. Um, you know the the one at at Chop. There's a, a, a hematologist there. Dr. Adams, who has a longstanding interest in this and is now head of the um, ISVA, it's a vascular anomaly society, and she has an interest in the genetics. So they have, uh, they were, they've been um, really helpful in uh, collaboration in us, um, you know, in, in the, because it's in the face, you can do a biopsy and send them tissue, or um, now with the we kind of translated it into the brain and now we're sending them um, brain uh, blood from the vein basically. And it's really amazing to be able to identify medication. Um, again, that's, it's, it's something that we have to collaborate across the country with, but I think uh, it would be great also in, in Mount Sinai, we've identified some uh, hematologist who's interested and, you know, maybe, uh, and we're trying to uh, talk to the geneticist here to, because um, we have enough, at least we have enough of the vein of gamma malformations to do um, research on this part, which I think is the future. <laughs>